The Enemy Unmasked by Bill Hughes An enemy has been stalking America for over 200 years. She is about to apply the death grip from which America will never recover. The book in your hands tells who the enemy is, who they have used in history, who is aiding them today, and how the final scenes will unfold. Chapter 1. Divine Hand Over the United States The United States of America is at the brink of total collapse. Once a great and powerful nation, the United States is now in a free fall to disaster from which she will never recover. A few more steps in its decline and it will be ruined. These are not easy words for a patriotic American to read, but nevertheless, they are absolutely true. Tragically, it need not have come to this. As one looks at the history of nations, from Babylon to Rome to America, it becomes evident that a divine hand was protecting and guiding America. From its humble beginning as a few colonies on the eastern seaboard, it became the greatest of nations. Quote, Alexis de Tocqueville, a young French philosopher of the last century, came to our shores to discover what magical quality enabled a handful of people to defeat the mighty British Empire twice in 35 years. He looked for the greatness of America in her fertile soil, her limitless forests, and natural resources. He examined America's schools, her Congress, and her unique constitution without fully understanding the source of America's strength. It was not, he said later, until he went to the churches of America and found congregations, quote, aflame with righteousness, end quote, that he began to com comprehend the secret of this power. Upon his return to France, de Tocqueville wrote, quote, America is great because America is good, and if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. That is a quote from a book by Des Griffin, Descent into Slavery, page 267. Carrying on in the book, in her youth, the United States was very good. On her money, her trust in God was proclaimed, and the great blessing of God rested upon this nation. As the United States grew to greatness, she gradually abandoned the principles that made her great until today she is approaching a very tragic end. The process of the decline of America is similar to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Let us examine a little of the history of ancient Rome and notice the parallels. As early Roman Empire was beginning to develop, it was building on the solid premise that the family unit was the cornerstone of society. Morality and discipline were the cornerstones of the family unit. As the empire developed, liberalism crept in, and the morality and discipline that protected society began to disappear. By the beginning of the 2nd century AD, most families followed the liberal trends, and their children were allowed to do pretty much as they pleased. This is a quote from the work by Jerome Carcopino called Daily Life in Ancient Rome, page 78 and 79. Quote, having given, given up the habit of controlling their children, they let their children govern them, and took pleasure in bleeding themselves white to gratify the expensive whims of their offspring. The result was that they were succeeded by a generation of idlers and wastrels, who had grown accustomed to luxury and lost all sense of discipline. As liberalism continued to progress, Rome eventually suffered an epidemic of divorces. From the same author, we find that a, that a strong women's rights movement developed in Roman society. This is also from Daily Life in Ancient Rome. Quote, Some wives evaded the duties of maternity for fear of losing their good looks. Some took pride in being behind their husbands in no sphere of activity and vied with them in tests of strength which their sex would seem to forbid. Some were not content to live their lives by their husband's side, but carried on another life without him. It is obvious that unhappy marriages must have been innumerable. Roman schools were in disarray. This is another quote from Daily Life in Ancient Rome. Quote, they undermined instead of strengthened the children's morals. They mishandled the children's bodies instead of developing them. And if they succeeded in furnishing their minds with a certain amount of information... They were not calculated to perform any loftier or nobler task. The pupils left school with the heavy luggage of a few practical and commonplace notions laboriously acquired and of so little value that in the 4th century 
Vegetius, a Roman writer who wrote about the Roman military system, could not take for granted that new recruits for the army would be literate enough to keep the books for the corpse. This kind of education led to a continual decline in morality and discipline and also resulted in decreasing patriotism. We have a quote here from Philip Meyer's work, Rome, Its Rise and Fall, page 515 and 516. Roman virtues, honesty, candor, frugality, and patriotism, withered and died. What was left was a people whom near, neither the vices of the rulers nor the increasingly bold attacks of foreign enemies could shake out of their apathy. In all the great cities of the provinces, the theater held the same place of bad preeminence in the social life of the inhabitants. The Roman stage was gross and immoral, and it was one of the main agencies to which must be attributed to the undermining of the originally sound moral life of Roman society. So absorbed did the people become in the independent or indecent representations on the stage that they lost all thought and care for the affairs of real life. Back to the book, another leading factor in the demise of Rome was that it became a welfare country. People were encouraged to be idle and receive money from the government rather than work to make their own way. The welfare system was a, quote, leading fact of Roman life. The evils that resulted from this misdirected state charity can hardly be overstated. Idleness and all its accompanying vices were fostered to such a degree that we shall probably not be wrong in enumerating the practice as one of the chief causes of the demoralization of Roman society. Carrying on in the book, it is obvious that the moral fabric of America today is where the morality of the Roman Empire was nearly 2,000 years ago. Do we not see the breakdown of the home, a strong women's rights movement, a deterioration in the school system, moral decay as espoused by the news and entertainment media, the schools and welfare eating the heart out of America? With regard to these problems, how are we any different from the Roman Empire during its decay? Why are these things happening in America? But that's the wrong question. The question should be, who is orchestrating these things to bring America to the brink of destruction? As mentioned earlier, Providence had its eye on the United States. America was the land of opportunity. It was the place where those who were being persecuted from their faith could come and worship God according to the dictates of their own consciousness. It was a land without a king where one could come and breathe the air of freedom. It was the place where one could come and earn a good living for himself and his family. America was the place where dreams came true. There once was a divine hand over America. In 1759, 25 years, more or less, stood between the 13 colonies and freedom from the British. 25 years and the world witnessed an unprecedented birth of freedom for people. 25 years in the framework for the Constitution, republicanism, inalienable rights, and a government of the people, by the people, and for the people was in sight. The United States was an experiment in government that was never before tried in history and became the greatest nation the world has ever seen. People have been taught for many years by the news media, the schools and colleges, and other means that the United States is a democracy. That is one gigantic lie. In the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, we see the that the United States was set up to be a republic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What is the difference? A democracy is a government where the majority rules without exception, with no restrictions of any kind. A republic is a government based on law, where the law restricts the actions of the government and lists the things the government can do and cannot do. The law that our republic is founded on is the Constitution. For instance, Here's the First Amendment of the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Carrying on in the book, it says that the government can make no law concerning religion. 
even if the entire country voted to pass a National Sunday law requiring everyone to go to church on Sunday. It cannot pass because the Constitution forbids it. An excellent example of a democracy is a lynch mob. The majority wants to hang the guy, and the minority does not, so they have a vote and hang the guy. There are no restrictions on a democracy. Many said a Republican government would not work. The Roman Catholic Church had ruled the world through the Dark Ages and sought to keep the world under her dictatorial control. She was, and still is, deathly afraid of such a government. For over 200 years, the Protestant Reformation had challenged the papacy's authority. The papacy gradually began losing her power. A free country like America was certainly not in the plans of the Catholic Church. The papacy could not allow a government to espouse principles that would bring it down. The monarchs of Europe ruled by permission of the papacy and wielded tyrannical control over people for ages, with no one to oppose them. The papacy was not willing to permit the development of a government where the people were free. Therefore, the papacy coerced the nations of Europe in an attempt to stop this American experiment with every weapon at their fingertips. By the 1550s, the Reformation had become so extensive in Europe that the papacy began to realize that they must do something to try to stop it. They realized that if it were not stopped, it would eventually undermine the position of the Catholic Church and destroy the absolute political power they had achieved. In order to accomplish the destruction of the Reformation, a new secret organization was formed within the Vatican called the Jesuits, or the Society of Jesus. One of the major purposes of the Jesuits is to destroy every trace of Protestantism and its principles, including religious freedom, republicanism, representative government, and an economy built around a strong middle class. Another purpose of the Jesuits is to greatly expand the power and control of the papacy throughout the world. This is a quote from G.B. Nicolini's History of the Jesuits, Their Origin, Progress, Doctrine, and Design. Quote, I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek, by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence, the duty they must fulfill or cease to be Jesuits. Accordingly, we find them in this evil dilemma. Either the Jesuits fulfill the duties of their calling, or not. In the first instance, they must be considered as the bitterest enemies of the Protestant faith. In the second, as bad and unworthy priests, and in both cases, therefore, to be equally regarded with aversion and distrust. End quote. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel unscrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the establishment of the papal supremacy. That's a quote from E.G. White, The Great Controversy, page 234. From their very beginning in the 1540s, the Jesuits did just that. They used any means they could devise to destroy Protestantism, including assassination to kill leaders who tried to bring freedom to their people. Two examples are William of Orange in 1584 and Henry IV in 1610. Both were slain by Jesuit assassins. The Jesuits used deception in the extreme to bring about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, where 70,000 Protestant Huguenots, including women and children, were slain in one night. They also created the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648 in order to destroy the Lutherans of Europe. The blood that re redeemed European soil for centuries can all be traced back to the murderous Jesuits. Starting in the 1600s, the Jesuits created a communist regime in Paraguay that eventually brought the Jesuits' demise in the 1700s. A quote from Boyd Barrett's work, The Jesuit Enigma, 
Quote, the Jesuits, as is well known, held very large regions of Paraguay under missionary control from 1650 to 1750. More than a quarter million natives worked under their direction, and no payment was made directly to them. They were educated, trained, housed, clothed, fed, and to some extent amused. But what became of the surplus profits of their labors and of the extensive trading that was carried on? Over 2,000 boats are said to have been engaged in carrying merchandise and goods on the Parana River, and the economic value of the reductions was beyond doubt very great, so great indeed as to have been awakened the envy of Spanish and Portuguese traders. Robertson estimated that the reductions represented at least 25 million capital for the Society of Jesus. End quote. The reductions were communist communes set up as manufacturing facilities using the Guarian Indians as slave laborers. The products they produced were sold in Europe and greatly enriched the Jesuit order. This is a quote from Eric Phelps' book, Vatican Assassins, on page 189. Quote, The reductions produced herbs, hides, tallows, clocks, and other goods, which the Jesuits traded in Europe in their huge fleet of ships. The profits were used to finance wars against the Protestant nations they had sworn to destroy. But all this wealth and power was acquired in secret, as the kings of Portugal and Spain knew nothing about the reductions. By the middle of the 1700s, the Jesuit order had become the powerhouse of Europe. According to Barrett, quote, The Jesuit order at last reached the pinnacle of its power and prestige in the early 18th century. It had become more influential and wealthier than any other organization, in the world. It held a position in world affairs that no oath-bound group of men has ever held before or since. Nearly all the kings and sovereigns of Europe had only Jesuits as directors of their consciences, so that the whole of Europe appeared to be governed by Jesuits only. The Jesuits ruled the world. The monarchs of Europe and the Pope himself had Jesuits as their confessors. The plans and plots were all alike known to them. Besides this, they were amassing a vast amount of wealth that allowed the Jesuits to do whatever they chose. With them controlling the world, how could the little colonies of America have had a chance to stand against the Jesuit-controlled monarchs of Europe? In an instant, the Jesuits could utilize an army at its disposal and crush the colonies. It was at this juncture in 1759 that something strangely divine began to happen. It began in Portugal. The Portuguese king, Joseph I, banished the Jesuits from his realm. This is a quote from Richard Thompson's The Footprints of the Jesuits, page 217-218. Quote, In Portugal, the culminating point was reached by an attempt to assassinate the king. The deed had been incited by the Jesuits, who had impressed ignorant and fanatical minds with the idea that no wrong was committed by killing a heretical king. That is one who did not submit to their dictation. Hence, as a measure absolutely essential to the life of the nations, the king issued a decree of banishment against the Jesuits as traitors, rebels, enemies to and aggressors on his person, his states, and the public peace and the general good of the people. The Jesuits were then seized and transported to the states for the Church of Italy. End quote. King Joseph's Portugal was the first Catholic kingdom of Europe to banish the Jesuits from their realm. With this first banishment, the dominoes began to fall rather quickly. Catholic France banished them in 1762. The decree of Louis the XV in the French Parliament reads as follows. Quote, Whereupon the investigation into the constitution and statutes of the Society of Jesuits resulted in the enactment of a parliamentary decree which shows the odium then attached to the society in France. It denounced their doctrines and practices, quote, as perverse, destructive of every principle of religion, and even of probity, as injurious to morality, pernicious to civil society, seditious, dangerous to rights of the persons of the sovereigns as fit to excite the greatest troubles in states, to form and maintain the most profound corruption in the hearts of men, 
that the institutions of the, of the Jesuits should forever cease to exist throughout the whole extent of the kingdom, end quote. The third sovereign to derive the Jesuits from their realm was King Charles III of Spain. He banished the Jesuits in 1767. Quote, his greatest work, Charles III, the expulsion of the Jesuits, would never have been carried out if he had not been persuaded of its political necessity. The Jesuit order had already been driven out by Pombal from Portugal and by Choasul from France when Charles III was convinced that a riot in Madrid had been promoted by the Jesuits. That quote comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 17, page 341. One year later, yet another nation banished this evil broad brood from their realm. Under the leadership of Fra Manuel Pinto de Fonseca, Fonseca, the Jesuits were forced to leave the island of Malta in 1768. Of this we read, quote, In 1768 the Jesuits, having given much trouble, were expelled and their property confiscated. The mightiest Catholic nations of Europe had banished the Jesuits from their realms. These Catholic monarchs demanded that the Catholic Church abolish the society forever. Clemente XIII, the Pope at the time, resisted their wishes but finally capitulated. The night before he planned to do this, he was poisoned to death. I have a long quote from Avro Manhattan's work, The Murder in the Vatican. Quote, during the night preceding the day appointed for the public ceremony of announcing the abolition, the abolition of the Jesuits, Clement the Thirteenth was suddenly seized with convulsions and died, leaving the act unperformed and the Jesuits victorious. Cormenin records this event in the terse and expressive words, quote, "The Jesuits had poisoned him." End quote. The Catholic monarchies of Europe, however, insisted that the Jesuits be disbanded, and threatened the Pope. Clement the Thirteenth, after endless indecision, postponements, and unconvincing delays, finally decided to do what he had been advised he should do. He capitulated. He made ready a proclamation announcing the suppression of the Jesuit order. It was said that the document was written and was waiting for the day when it was to be made public. To the surprise of all, however, the Pope was suddenly attacked by a mysterious illness. He died on the 12th of February... 1769 with agonizing unexplained convulsions rumor had it that he had been poisoned and the sudden and the suddenness of his affliction and the convulsions both pointed to it the suspicions however were never proved it was suggested by those in the know that the pope had been made to die before he could publish the announcements of the official suppression of the jesuit order four years later in 1773 Three years before the Declaration of Independence, mark it well, Pope Clement the Fourteenth wrote an order, the purpose of which was to abolish the Jesuits forever. Unfortunately, a later pope reestablished them in 1814. But of this we read, again, in July 1773, Pope Clement the Fourteenth wrote an order dissolving the Society of Jesus. This bowl... Dominicus Ac Redemptor was published 16th of August of that year. After issuing it, however, the Pope relented in fear of the consequences and tried to withdraw it. Too late, the Spanish ambassadors had already dispatched the document by special courier direct to Madrid. The papal brief annihilated the Jesuit order throughout the world, closed its schools, and canceled its statutes. Its houses were occupied, its general and other dignitaries were imprisoned. That is a quote, again, from Avro Manhattan's Murder in the Vatican. In a 14-year period from 1759 to 1773, the Catholic monarchs of Europe and the Pope himself were pre preoccupied with abolishing the Jesuits. Emmett McLaughlin's tremendous book, An Inquiry into the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, summarizes these events very succinctly with these words. Quote, Even their own Catholic countries finally became surfeited with 
Jesuit political intrigue and financial avarice and, in self-preservation, were forced to expel them. Portugal, Angola, Goa, and Brazil took the lead in 1759. France followed in 1764. Several Italian states such as Parma, Sicily, and Naples followed suit. By sealed imperial orders sent to their colonies around the world, Spain threw out all Jesuits in 1767. This decree suppressed them in the Philippines, Argentina, New Granada, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Guatemala, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, New Mexico, and Arizona. Austria did the same in 1773. Finally, Pope Clement XIV in 1773 issued the document Dominicus Ac Redemptor, abolishing the Jesuit order altogether, listing 11 popes that tried to curb their excesses. Among them were Benedict the uh, the 14th, Innocent the 11th, Innocent the 13th, and Clement the 13th. He cited the Jesuits for opposition to, quote, other religious orders, end quote, for, quote, revolts and, and intestine troubles in some of the Catholic states, end quote, and, quote, persecutions against the church in Europe and Asia. There remained no other remedy to so great evils, and this step was necessary in order to prevent the Christians from rising once one against the other from and from massacring each other in the very bosom of our common mother the holy church end quote. wherefore he wrote quote, after a mature deliberation we do out of our certain knowledge and the fullness of our apostolic power suppress ab- and abolish the said company Emmett McLaughlin an inquiry into the assassination of Abraham Lincoln Page 84 and 85. <clears throat> the timing of these events in Europe is fascinating. Catholic Europe was in disarray. The Catholic monarchs were preoccupied with taking care of the problems with the Jesuit order. The Jesuits were reeling as one Catholic country after another drove them from their realms. While Europe was shaking, 13 colonies across the Atlantic were looking at the very real possibility of war with England. The 13 colonies were instituting principles of government never before heard in the annals of human history. Documents would soon be written that would codify such things as inalienable rights, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, free exercise of religion, and the right to keep and bear arms. These documents would soon be the hope of mankind throughout the world longing to be free. What if the Catholic monarchs were not distracted by their dealings with the Jesuits? What if the Jesuits were not reeling by their banishment from Europe? The monarchs and the Jesuits would have utilized their wealth and military power to smash the American colonies in the New World, and the Protestant dream in America would have never been a reality. Without a doubt, there was a divine hand over America. Chapter 2. The Illuminati Jewish Front There are many books and treatises on the conspiracy theory of history. It is very difficult to find any two of them that agree. Some say the perpetrators behind the scenes are the Illuminati, and others say the Jews. The list of the conspiratorial organizations blamed includes the Communists, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Committee of 300, the Mafia, the Round Table, the Club of Rome, the Freemasons, the CIA, FBI, Mossad, and other secret societies. Of course, the New World Order, the European Union, and the international bankers must be included in this list also. Because of all the organizations accused of conspiracy, most most people tend to disbelieve the conspiracy theory of history. If they do believe it, they tend to be thoroughly confused as to which organizations are responsible. In addition, To the organizations mentioned above, there are other conspiratorial organizations that remain in the background so that they are hidden from the view of the public. Let us investigate these secret organizations and discover the extent that they control our world. Dr. Corey Agena is the economic advisor to Russian President Vladimir Putin. In a radio interview with Rick Wiles of American Freedom News, 
Dr. Coriagina declared, quote, Everybody knows about organized crime and the mafia. Also, people have known for a very long time about secret societies and so forth. During my research, I started to notice that those structures can be put together and joined, and I realized that right now we have a criminal monster, a hybrid of organized crime, mafia, and secret societies that have merged together. That was aired December 6th, 2001. Carrying on in the book, this resulting gigantic organization takes its marching orders from one source and has one human leader. This chapter will show conclusively who the human leader of the Illuminati, the Jews, and all other groups really is. As we saw in chapter 1, the Catholic monarchs and the Pope himself were trying to ban the Jesuit order throughout the entire world in 1773. In order to survive, the Jesuits were forced to either go underground or travel to three countries where they were still permitted to operate. England, Germany, which was Prussia at the time, and Russia. During this time frame, the Illuminati was created. This is a quote from The History of Protestantism by Wiley, Volume 2, page 413. Quote, It is an unshakable fact that the founder of the modern Bavarian Illuminati was a trained Jesuit named Adam Weishaupt from Ingolstadt, Bavaria. Weishaupt was a professor at Ingolstadt University, which was the center of the Jesuit counter-reformation. Ingolstadt was the center where the Jesuits were flourishing in 1556. This is another quote from Sidney Hunter, Is Alberto for Real? Referring to Alberto Rivera, page 21 and 22. Quote, it is an unshakable... Oh, I'm sorry. Can we really believe that Weishaupt would have been allowed to continue his professorship in a Jesuit-controlled university if he had deserted them? No way. All evidence suggests that he continued to work for the Jesuits, establishing the order of the Illuminati for them. This is a quote from Eric Phelps, Vatican Assassins, page 214. On May 1st, 1776, the Order of the Illuminati was officially founded in the old Jesuit stronghold of Bavaria, from which the Sons of Loyola had ignited the Thirty Years' War. Another quote from Lady Queensborough in her work, Occult Theocracy. From the Jesuit College at Engelstadt, it's said to have issued the sect known as the Illuminati of Bavaria, founded by Adam Weishaupt. Its nominal founder, however, seems to have played a subordinate, though conspicuous, role in the organization of this sect. Another quote from D. Zaner, The Secret Side of History, page 21, or t page 26. The organization is a secret society founded in Bavaria in 1776. Its founder, Adam Weishaupt, a professor of canon law at the University of Engelstadt, labeled it the Illuminati Order. Carrying on in the book, Canon law was the result of the infamous Council of Trent, which met from 1545 to 1563. This law revealed the Catholic Church's stand against the Protestant Reformation and is known as the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This council not only revealed the Church's hostility towards the Reformation, but also how she would attack and destroy it. Weishaupt established the Illuminati specifically to be a front organization behind which the Jesuits could hide. After being abolished by Clement fourteen in 1773, the Jesuits used the Illuminati and other similar organizations to carry out their operations. Thus, the front or organization would be blamed by the troubled cause by the trouble caused by the Jesuits. Having so many front organizations would also confuse the people so that it would be virtually impossible to know who is actually manipulating the wars, policies, politics, and trouble caused by the Jesuits. The methods of many of these front organizations, such as the Illuminati, are carbon copies of the Jesuits' methods and techniques, which are still in use today. I have a quote here from Nesta Webster's Secret Societies and Subversive Movements book, page 197 to 198. Quote, this passage exactly describes the methods laid down by Weishaupt for his, quote, insinuating brothers, end quote. The necessity of proceeding with caution in the enlisting of adepts, of not revealing to the novice doctrines that might be likely to revolt him, of, quote, speaking sometimes in one way, sometimes in another, so that one's real purpose should remain impenetrable, end quote, to members of the inferior grades. How did these oriental methods penetrate to the Bavarian professor? 
according to certain writers, through the Jesuits. The fact that Weishaupt had been brought up by this order has proved that the enemies of the Jesuits with the argument that they were the secret inspirers of the Illuminati. That Weishaupt did, however, draw to a certain extent on Jesuit methods of training is recognized by even Baruel, himself a Jesuit, who, quoting Maribé, says that Weishaupt, quote, admired above all those laws that regime of the Jesuits, which, under one head, made men dispersed over the universe tend towards the same goal. Thus far we have seen that Weishaupt has trained, or was trained by the Jesuits, and the principles of the Jesuits were incorporated into the Illuminati in total. When Weishaupt created the Illuminati on May 1st, 1776, he was teaching at Engelstadt University, a Jesuit college. It is obvious that the Jesuits used Weishaupt to create the Illuminati as a front for their subversive activities. This is a quote from Eric John Phelps' book, Vatican Assassins, page 206, 205, 213, and 215. During the, quote, during the order of suppression from 1773 to 1814 by Pope Clement XIV, General Ricci, the head of the Jesuits, created the Illuminati with his soldier, Adam Weishaupt, the father of modern communism, who, with his Jacobins, conducted the French Revolution. For the sons of Loyola a.k.a. the Jesuits, punished all their enemies, including the Dominican priests, perfected the inner workings between themselves and Freemasonry, created an alliance between the House of Rothschild and establishing the Illuminati. The Jesuit general was in control of Scottish Rite Freemasonry and now sought an alliance with the Masonic Baron of the House of Rothschild. To accomplish this, he chose a Jesuit who was a German Gentile, not a Jew, by race and a free man by association, Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt established the Illuminati in 1776 and joined the Grand Orient Masonic Lodge in 1777. He united the magnificent financial empire of the Masonic Jewish House of Rothschild with the opulence of the international and secret anti-Jewish race, Gentile Society of Jesus. The House of Rothschild financed Weishaupt in his creation of the Illuminati. Phelps alluded to this several times in the preceding quote. He is not alone in his assertion that the Jewish House of Rothschild worked hand-in-hand hand with the Jesuits in creating and funding the Illuminati. Quote, After he, Weishaupt, formed his organization with financial backing from the House of Rothschild, he adopted the name Illuminati. It was on May 1, 1776, that Adam Weishaupt, backed and led by the House of Rothschild, formed the international revolutionary force called the Illuminati, which later became known as Communism. That's a quote from William Sutton, The New Age Movement, in the Illuminati, 666. Quote, Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Jewish family, I looked them up in the Encyclopedia Judaica and discovered that they bear the title, quote, Guardians of the Vatican Treasury, end quote. The appointment of Rothschilds gave the Black Papacy absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the keys to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? That's a quote from Tupper Saucy's Rulers of Evil, page 160 and 161. The expression, quote, black papacy, end quote, is sometimes used to mean the Jesuits. The Jesuits are referred to in this quotation. With the financial power of the Rothschilds behind Weishaupt's Illuminati, the Jesuits and the Catholic Church have an almost perfect cover to hide their operations from the view of the public. When investigations, when investigators tried to trace the roots of certain events, the Illuminati is a perfect shield behind which the Jesuits can hide and behind which investigators cannot penetrate. The implications of this are enormous. We will briefly consider two items here, but will examine them in greater detail in following chapters. The book, Descent into Slavery, shows that there was a plan for both world wars and even a third world war. Quote, This plan was outlined in graphic detail by Albert Pike, the sovereign grand commander of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and the top Illuminist in America, in a letter to Giuseppe Mazzini, dated August 15, 1871. Knowing what we know about the Illuminati, Albert Pike was speaking as one who understood the Jesuits' plan for world domination to bring everything back into the Pope's hands. Pike was the top Illuminist Jesuit in America. Pike stated that the First World War was to be fomented in order to destroy Tsarist Russia and to place that vast land under the direct control of Illuminati agents. 
Russia was then to be used as a, quote, boogeyman, end quote, to further the aims of the Illuminati worldwide. World War II was to be fomented through manipulation of the differences that existed between the German nationalists and the political Zionists. This was to result in an expansion of Russian influence and the establishment of a state of Israel and Palestine. The Third World War was planned to result from the differences stirred up by the Illuminati agents between the Zionists and the Arabs. The conflict was planned to spread worldwide. This is uh, a quote from Descent into Slavery by Des Griffin. Back to the book. Pike shows in that quote that the Jesuits are planning for a third world war between the Zionists and the Arabs. Zionists are those who are pro-Israel, like the United States and Great Britain. The so-called war on terror is part of the preparation for that war using Iraq, Iran, Al-Qaeda, and others against the Zionists of America and Great Britain. The Jesuits are stirring up this conflict by their lies and deception, such as the false claim that Saddam Hussein was stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. This lie was simply a ploy to convince the American people that we had no choice but to invade Iraq. As will be shown later, the Bush administration is working closely with the Jesuits to carry out their policies to the letter. The current conflict was planned over 130 years ago. The Illuminati-slash-Jesuit connection also impacts us in another way. In Fritz Springmeier's book, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, we read that the two Bush presidents were members of the Skull and Bones Order at Yale. The Skull and Bones Order is an entry point into the Illuminati. It is made to appear as just another exclusive fraternity, but in actuality, a member of the Skull and Bones Order is also a member of the Illuminati. We have seen that this means that the two Bush presidents are also members of the Jesuit Order and are carrying out their wishes. Springmeyer also points out that the Bush family has been tied up with the Harriman family since the 1920s. The Harrimans have been intimately connected with the Skull and Bones Order slash Illuminati slash Jesuits for decades. It is a most sobering thought to realize that the Jesuit Order controls the President of the United States. It is also a most sobering thought to think that this great Protestant nation is under the control of a man who is willingly carrying out the dictates of an order whose stated objective is the destruction of every Protestant principle for which this nation stands. If permitted, this president would shred the Constitution. He is passing laws such as the USA Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act, which totally ignore the restrictions on such laws in the Constitution. This president has been told to engage in war in the Middle East. He has done so knowing that many lives in America's youth would be lost. This is nothing but a deliberate act of treason. When will Americans wake up and see what is being done to them? Let us now examine the false claim that the Jews are really the bad people who are behind the scenes manipulating the world. Many people become very angry when this claim is made. The American Free Press, the John Birch Society, and others, organizations of the media, go to great lengths to slander and discredit those who believe the Jesuits are behind everything. Interestingly enough, the American Free Press invites cardinals from the Catholic Church to serve as their keynote speakers at meetings, and the president of the John Birch Society is a devout Roman Catholic. Is it possible that both the American Free Press and the John Birch Society, which both advocate a conspiratorial view of of history are actually being used by the Jesuits to sidetrack people from the real source from which all the conspiracies originate? The propaganda in the media today tries desperately to convict the Jesuits as the real instigators of the trouble in the world. The Jewish belief that Christ will one day come and rule the world causes the Vatican to shudder. The Vatican believes that if hatred for the Jews can be fomented as took place in Hitler's Germany, then Jews will be ruthlessly eliminated. The Vatican believes that if all Jews were, are killed, Christ will not come, and the Vatican's aim to rule the world would remain intact. Avro Manhattan says it this way, quote, It is important, although it may be difficult for some to recognize the religious nature of the communist-slash-Zionist-slash-Catholic political configuration. Although deliberately muted in public pronounce, pronouncements behind the Zionist banner, there was to be found the ancient messianic hope for the coming of a global theocracy, as predicted by all the seers and prophets of Zion. It was to be a theocracy in which Jehovah, not Christ, 
was to be king. The specter of the creation of such a theocracy has haunted the inner chambers of the Catholic Church from her earliest inception and still is a dominant fear. In Vatican eyes, therefore, the millenarian, millenarian yearning for a global Hebrew theocracy represents a deadly threat to the eschatological teachings of the Catholic Church. When translated into concrete political terms, such a view spells not only rivalry, but implacable enmity. Avram Manhattan, The Vatican, Moscow, Washington Alliance, page 169 and 170. Why would the Jesuits use their implacable enemy, the Jews, to further their designs for world domination? The Jesuits never do anything out in the open where they can be exposed. If they are recognized as the culprits, they will be blamed and suffer the consequences. But if they can use someone else as the cause of the world's problems, especially an enemy that can destroy in the process, then they have simultaneously accomplished two of their objectives. The Jewish people are the perfect scapegoat. Since the Rothschilds are Jesuits operating under a Jewish cover, using them in forming the Illuminati back in 1776 effectively throws the onus of this conspiracy on the Jews. The Rothschilds are certainly not the only Jesuits that operate under a Jewish front. The following resources indicate that Adam Weishaupt and the Rothschilds were the brains and the wealth behind this French Revolution. Quote, History books will tell us that the French Revolution first began in 1787 or 1789, depending on which book you read. However, it was actually planned by Dr. Adam Weishaupt and the House of Rothschilds almost 20 years before the revolution took place. William Sutton, The New Age Movement in the Illuminati 666, page 172-173. Another quote, For the main purpose of Boreal's book is to show that not only had Illuminism in the Grand Orient Masonry contributed largely to the French Revolution, but that three years after that first explosion, they were still as active as ever. Nesta Webster's Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, page 255. Another quote, they, the Jesuits, have so constantly mixed themselves up in court and state intrigues that they must, in justice, be reproached with striving after world dom dominion. They cost kings their lives, not on the scaffold, but by assassination, and equally hurtful as the society of the Illuminati, they were the foremost among the crowd, at all events, who applauded the murder scenes in Paris. That's Hector McPherson, The Jesuits in History. Page 126, 127. Back to the book, the Jesuits, Weishaupt, and the Rothschilds managed to cast the blame for the French Revolution on their front organization, the Illuminati. The communistic ideals that came from the reductions in Paraguay and that were exalted in France had their fruition in the writings of Karl Marx. Quote, the ideas Lenin developed were directly from Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, and ideas founded in the Communist Manifesto were directly from the writings of Dr. Adam Weishaupt, who took his orders from the House of Rothschild. William Sutton and the New Age Movement and the Illuminati, 666, page 193. Another quote, Karl Marx was hired by a mysterious group who called themselves, quote, the League of Just Men, quote, end quote, to write the Communist Manifesto as a demagogic boob bait to appeal to the mob. In actual fact, the Communist Manifesto was in circulation for many years before Marx's name was widely enough recognized to establish his authorship for this revolutionary handbook. All Marx did was update and codify the very same revolutionary plans and principles set down 70 years earlier by Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Order of the Illuminati in Bavaria. And it is widely acknowledged by serious scholars of this subject that the League of the Just Men was simply an extension of the Illuminati. Gary Allen, end quote, Gary Allen, none dare call it a conspiracy. Page 25. Quote, Karl Marx, the father of, the modern, of modern communism, was privately tutored by the Jesuits in the huge reading room of the British Museum while writing the Communist Manifesto, based upon the ten maxims or planks the order had perfected on its Paraguayan reductions. A Jew was chosen for this task, for the order anticipated blaming all the evils of their communist inquisition on the Jewish race. 
That's a quote from Eric John Phelps, Vatican Assassins, page 293. Adam Weishaupt and the Rothschild family created the Illuminati. Then both Weishaupt and the Rothschilds united their efforts to control the French Revolution and the roots of communism. The Jesuits used, next used Karl Marx to write the Communist Manifesto, which codified the Illuminati's plans. The teachings of Marx were then passed to Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky. The financiers of all these men were the Rothschilds or Rothschild agents, such as Paul Warburg, the first chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Jacob Schiff, and Armand Hammer. Each of these men, being Jesuits, were Jews and operated under a Jewish front. It is, is it any wonder that the Jews are usually blamed for all the conspiracies? Other Jesuits who operate under a Jewish front include the former chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan, Senator Arlen Specter, and Henry Kissinger. The next chapter will further expose these Jesuit bankers. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Criminal Bankers Because Pope Clement the Fourteenth and the Catholic emperors across Europe were busy abolishing the Jesuits, they were not able to cooperate with each other well enough to stop the Protestant American experiment. If a divine hand had not intervened to protect the thirteen colonies, there would never have been a United States with its God-given constitution. The Jesuits were greatly troubled because of their expulsions around the world, and they were forced to go underground. We have seen that they used their agent, Adam Weishaupt, to create the Illuminati and used the Jesuit House of Rothschild to finance it in order to create revolutions and to destroy Protestantism around the world. America was becoming a giant of financial affluence and prosperity and was becoming a serious competitor for the Rothschilds and the papacy who were trying to use their wealth to gain political and religious dominance in America. Quote, Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Jewish family, I looked them up in Cyclopedia Judaica and discovered that they bear the titles, quote, Guardian of the Vatican Treasury. The appointment of the Rothschilds gave the black papacy, the Jesuits, absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would, who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? That quote is from F. Tupper Saucy, Rulers of Evil, page 160 and 161. The Jesuits used the powerful financial empire of the Rothschilds to obtain control through money and destroy America. Biographer Frederick Morton concluded that through the effective use of money, the Rothschilds had successfully, quote, conquered the world more thoroughly, more cunningly, and much more lastingly than all the Caesars before all the Hitlers after them. Frederick Morton, The Rothschilds, A Family Portrait, page 14. The Rothschilds believe that if they could control a nation's money, then they can control that country. This is clearly pointed out in the following statement from biographer Derek Wilson. Quote, The banking community has always constituted a fifth estate whose members were able, by their control of royal purse strings, to effect important events. But the House of Rothschild was immensely more powerful than any financial empire that had ever preceded it. It commanded vast wealth. It was international. It was independent. Royal governments were nervous of it because they could not control it. Popular governments hated it because it was not answerable to the people. That's a quote from Derek Wilson, The Rothschild, The Wealth and Power of a Dynasty, page 79, 98, and 99. Using the vast wealth of the Rothschilds, the Jesuits equipped armies to destroy countries that would not do what they dictated. They could buy politicians and through them change the very laws of a nation. This is exactly what they did in America and are still doing today. The Jesuits have used the Rothschild's wealth to control major events behind the scenes worldwide for centuries. Today, however, they use the central banks in each country, including the Federal Reserve in America, to supply them with funds. Central banks and how they operate are discussed in following paragraphs. To illustrate how the Jesuits and Rothschilds have used countries and events to gain domination over nations and financial markets, we must look at the Battle of Waterloo between France and England on June 9, 1815. Quote, There were vast fortunes to be made and lost on the outcome of the Battle of Waterloo. The stock exchange in London was at fever pitch as traders awaited news of the outcome of this Battle of the Giants. If Britain lost, English consuls would plummet to unprecedented depths. If Britain was to was victorious, the value of the consul would leap to new dizzying heights. 
As the two huge armies closed in for the battle to the death, Nathan Rothschild had his agents work fervishly on both sides of the line to gather the most accurate possible information as the battle proceeded. Additional Rothschild agents were on hand to carry the intelligence bulletins to the Rothschild command post strategically located nearby. Late on the afternoon of June 19, 1815, a Rothschild representative jumped on board a specially chartered boat and headed out into the channel in a hurried dash for the English coast. In his possession was a top-secret top report from Rothschild Secret Service agents on the progress of the crucial battle. This intelligence data would prove indispensable to Nathan in making some vital decisions. The special agent was met at Folkestone the following morning at dawn by Nathan Rothschild himself. After quickly scanning the highlights of the report, Rothschild was on his way again, speeding towards London and the stock exchange. Arriving at the exchange amid frantic speculation on the outcome of the battle, Nathan took up his position beside the famous Rothschild pillar. Without a sign of emotion, without the slightest change of facial expression, the stony-faced, flint-eyed chief of the Rothschild, House of Rothschild gave a predetermined signal to his agents who had stationed, were stationed nearby. Rothschild agents immediately began to dump consoles on the market. As hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of consoles poured onto the market, their values started to slide. Then they began to plummet. Nathan continued to lean against his pillar, emotionless, expressionless. He continued to sell and sell and sell. Consoles kept on falling. Word began to sweep through the stock exchange. Quote, Rothschild knows, Rothschild knows, end quote. Wellington has lost at Waterloo. The selling turned into a panic as people rushed to unload their worthless consoles or paper money for gold and silver in the hope of retaining at least part of their wealth. Consoles continued their nosedive towards oblivion. After several hours of feverish trading, the console lay in ruins. It was selling for about five cents on the dollar. Nathan Rothschild, emotionless and expressionless as ever, still leaned against his pillar. He continued to give subtle signals, but these signals were different. They were so subtly different that, the on that only the highly trained Rothschild agents could detect the change. On the queue from their boss, dozens of Rothschild agents made their way to the order desks around the exchange and bought every console in sight for just a, quote, song, end quote. A short time later, the official news arrived in the British capital. England was now the master of the European scene. Within seconds, the console skyrocketed to above its original value as the significance of the British victory began to sink into the public consciousness. The value of the consoles rose ever higher. Napoleon had, quote, met his Waterloo, end quote. Nathan had, brought, had bought control of the British economy. Overnight, his already vast fortunes was multiplied 20 times over. That is a quote from Descent into Slavery by Des Griffin. Page 27 and 28. Back to the book. By 1815, the Jesuits had complete control over England. If a leader did not do as he was told, money would be used to kill, smear, destroy, blackmail, or just drive the person from office. Later chapters will show that this procedure is being used today to control people like George Bush and Tony Blair. What was done in England is being done in many countries today. As the new nation of America began to spread its wings, it would need a sound financial base from which to operate. It needed a bank, all right, but the bank used America instead of America using the bank. Financial genius and opportunist Robert Morris organized the first central bank. He and his associates believed that the bank should be modeled after the Bank of England. While the first bank in North America was not as ruthless as the central banks of today, it per performed many of the operations of a modern central bank. Quote unquote secret in the operations of a modern central bank. Secret investors put up 400000 to start this bank. This bank lasted for two years. We will identify the quote secret investors end quote in following paragraphs. Please understand that the central banks being established by the Jesuits and the Rothschilds are in no way similar to the neighborhood banks that we all use to manage our money. Let us take a closer look at the central bank and why it is so dangerous. We will use the Federal Reserve Bank as an example. Here is a very simplified scenario 
that pretty much explains one of the operations of the Federal Reserve Bank. It is necessary to understand that the Federal Reserve Bank is not owned by the United States government, as many believe. The central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, is a private bank owned by some of the richest and most powerful people in the world. This bank has nothing to do with the U.S. government other than the connection, which allows the operation described below. The private Federal Reserve Bank has a total government-enforced monopoly in money. Before we had the central bank, each individual bank competed with other banks. The customers, the consumers, got the best deal. Not anymore. We all know that today the United States government borrows money and operates under astronomical debt. Why is this? Common sense dictates that a policy of such enormous debt will sooner or later destroy the organization that practices it. Because the interest on its debt must increase beyond its income, making payoff impossible. Now to our scenario. Here, roughly, is how the operation proceeds. Suppose the United States government wants to borrow a billion dollars. The government issues a bond for this amount. Much as a water company does when it wants to raise money for a new pipeline or a new dam. The government derives this bond for the, for the billion dollars to the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank takes the bond and writes an order to the Department of Printing and Engraving to print the billion dollars worth of bills. After about two weeks or so when the bills are printed, the Department of Printing and Engraving ships the bills to the Federal Reserve Bank, which then writes a check for about $2,000 to pay for printing the billion dollars worth of bills. The Federal Reserve Bank then takes the billion dollars and lends the billion dollars to the United States government, and the people of the country pay interest at an exorbitant rate each year on this money, which came out of nothing. The owners of the Federal Reserve Bank put up nothing for this money. We see, therefore, that when the United States government goes into debt, one dollar, a dollar plus the interest goes into the pockets of the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the largest and most colossal theft ever perpetrated in the history of mankind, and it is so slick, so subtle, and so obfuscated by propaganda from the news media that the victims are not even aware of what is happening. You can see why the Jesuits want to keep this operation secret. The Constitution of the United States gives the Congress the power to coin money. If Congress coined its own money as the con Constitution directs, it would not have to pay the hundreds of billions of dollars in interest that is now paid each year to the bankers for the national debt for money that came out of nothing. Money coined by Congress would be debt-free. All the central banks in other countries operate the way the Federal Reserve does. Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton submitted a proposal to Congress in 1790 for a central bank. Interestingly enough, Hamilton had been an aide to Robert Morris in the initial experience of central banking in North America. Surprisingly, during the Constitutional Convention of 1787, Hamilton had been a strong supporter of sound money. That Hamilton completely shifted his position within three years and proposed a central bank, which could generate the phony money as the Federal Reserve Bank does, shows that Hamilton's loyalty was completely compromised by the Jesuits. Notice the title of the book this quote, next quote is taken from. The creature from Jekyll Island is the Federal Reserve Bank. This bank was planned by conspirators who met for this purpose on Jekyll Island. Quote, this is hard to reconcile, and one must suspect that even the most well-intentioned of men can become corrupted by the temptations of wealth and power. That's a quote from G. Edward, Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, page 328. Note carefully Griffin's conclusion. For Alexander Hamilton to have shifted so drastically within a few short years would lead us to believe that he had been bribed or blackmailed by quote, secret investors, end quote. Thomas Jefferson clearly saw what a central bank would do to America, and he gave the following most profound warning. Quote, a private central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army. Jefferson realized that if a central bank was ever set up in America, the bankers would have virtually unlimited amounts of money to control how lawmakers voted and to control the media and what they said. Within a short time, these bankers would essentially rewrite the Constitution and the Bill of Rights by the unconstitutional laws that they would pass. Thomas Jefferson was completely correct, for today we have enough unconstitutional laws, such as the U.S. 
Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act to literally convert the United States into a police state after all the provisions of these acts are implemented. Just like the old Bank of North America, the new Bank of the United States had 80% of its initial funding capital provided by quote-unquote secret investors, and the government put up only 20%. Whoever these quote-unquote secret investors were, they had tremendous power in America because they had control of the money in America. Many books written about that time period tell us who these people were. Quote, under the surface, the Rothschilds long had a powerful influence in dictating American financial laws. The law records show that they were the power in the old bank of the United States. That's a quote from Gus Davis Myers in his book, History of the Great American Fortunes, page 556. Another quote, Over the years since Nathan Rothschild, the Manchester textile manufacturer, had brought cotton from the southern states, Rothschilds had developed heavy American commitments. Nathan had made loans to various states of the Union, had been, for a time, the official European banker for the U.S. government, and was a pledged supporter of the Bank of the United States. That is a quote from Derek Wilson in his book, Rothschild, The Wealth and Power of a Dynasty, page 178. The Rothschilds and the Jesuits have been using their vast wealth to take over the United States through their traitorous politicians for many years. During the time of the Rothschilds in Victorian England, Benjamin Disraeli was the prime minister for many years. In 1844, he wrote a political novel entitled Coningsby. One of the key characters in the book was a very powerful merchant and banker by the name of Sidonia. It is apparent from the events chronicled that Sidonia is really Nathan Rothschild of England. In the book, Disraeli declares, quote, Europe did require money, and Sidonia was ready to lend it to Europe. France wanted some, Austria more. Prussia a little, Russia a few million, Sidonia could furnish them all. It is not difficult to conceive that, after having pursued the career we have intimated for about ten years, Sidonia, who's really Nathan Rothschild, had become one of the most considerable personages in Europe. He had established a brother or a near relative in whom he could confide in most of the principal capitals. He was lord and master of the money market of the world, and of course virtually lord and master of everything else. He literally held the revenues of southern Italy in pawn, and monarchs and ministries of all countries courted his advice and were guided by his suggestions. Back to the book. The Jesuits and the Rothschilds would settle for nothing less. After the Hamilton Central Bank failed, the Jesuits were able to establish a third central bank using Nicholas Biddle as their agent in 1816. The, ch the charter for this bank ran until 1836. Biddle made an attempt to renew the charter of this third bank during the presidential campaign of 1832. Biddle believed that Andrew Jackson would not dare to risk his second term in office by opposing him, so Biddle felt this was the perfect time to renew the bank's charter. Andrew Jackson understood the dangers of the central bank and vetoed the bill to renew the bank's charter. Jackson's argument was simple. Quote, is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our country? Is there not cause to tremble for the purity of our elections in peace and for the independence of our country in war? Of course, of the course which would be pursued by a bank almost wholly owned by the subjects of a foreign power and managed by those whose interests, if not affections, would run in the same direction, there can be no doubt, controlling our currency, receiving our public monies, and holding thousands of our citizens in dependence, it would be more formidable and dangerous than a naval and military power of the enemy. That's in a book called The Documentary History, Documentary History of Banking and Currency in the United States by Herman Cruz. Jackson feared that the foreigners who wanted to dominate and control America would use the central bank to destroy her. The Rothschilds and the Jesuits have been doing just that for many years using the Federal Reserve Bank. The following quote shows how Nicholas Biddle manipulated the Congress. Quote, Biddle had one powerful advantage over his adversaries. 
For all practical purposes, Congress was in his pocket. Or more accurately, the product of his generosity was in the pockets of congressmen. Following the Rothschild formula, Biddle had been careful to reward compliant politicians with success in the business world. Few of them would bite the hand that fed them. Even the great senator, Daniel Webster, found himself kneeling at Biddle's throne. That's a quote from G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, page 351. By early 1930s, the Biddle Rothschild Jesuit plan was working perfectly. They controlled the congressmen and senators of the United States by giving them money to become successful in the business world. As long as the congressmen voted as they were told, their business did well, but if they disobeyed the bankers, their money and their other resources were withheld, and their businesses failed. Quote, Biddle was not without resources. In keeping with his belief that banking was the ultimate source of power, he had regularly advanced funds to members of Congress, then delay on appropriation bills had held up their pay. Daniel Webster was, at various times, a director of the bank and on retainer as its counsel. Quote, I believe my retainer has not been renewed or refreshed as usual. If it be wished that my relation to the bank be continued, it may well it may be well to send me the usual retainers, end quote. Numerous other men of distinction had been accommodated, including members of the press. It's a quote from John Kenneth Galbraith's book, Money, Whence It Came, Where It Went, page 80. Webster's, records, Webster's record in Congress had previously been in behalf of sound money. When Biddle bought Webster with money and other enticements, he succumbed and became a supporter of the corrupt banking objectives of Biddle. Webster became one of the central bank's most avid supporters. How tragic that Daniel Webster did not have the moral courage to withstand Biddle's bribes. In the early 1830s, Congress had many Jesuits seeking to secretly undermine the great principles of our Constitution. When Andrew Jackson finally ousted Nicholas Biddle in the central bank, he had to face other things, such as Jesuit assassins. Quote, with, these with these accomplishments close on the heels of his victory over the bank, the president had earned the undying hatred of monetary scientists, both in America and abroad. It is not surprising, therefore, that on January 30, 1835, an assassination attempt was made against him. Miraculously, both pistols of the assailant misfired, and Jackson was spared by a Kirk of fate. It was the first attempt, such attempt to be made against the life of a president of the United States. The would-be assassin was Richard Lawrence, who either was truly insane or who pretended to be insane to escape harsh punishment. At any rate, Lawrence was found not guilty due to insanity. Later, he boasted to friends that he had been in touch with powerful people in Europe who had promised to protect him from punishment should he be caught. That's a quote from G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, page 357. The Rothschild Jesuit conspirators are ruthless, sick individuals who will stop at nothing until Protestantism in the United States are destroyed, and the papacy rules the world again. The Rothschilds and the Jesuits needed to regroup. For the next 20 years, the name of the game was assassination as two presidents were poisoned and one was almost killed by poisoning. Then the Civil War began in America. According to German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, all of this, including the Civil War, was carefully planned. Quote, the division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained in one block and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence, which would upset their financial dominion over Europe and the world. Of course, in the inner circle of finance, the voice of the Rothschilds prevailed. They saw an opportunity for prodigious booty if they could substitute two feeble democracies, burdened with debt to the financiers, in place of a vigorous republic sufficient unto herself. Therefore, they sent their emissaries into the field to exploit the question of slavery and to drive a wedge between the two parts of the Union. The rupture between the North and the South became inevitable. The masters of European finance employed all their forces to bring it about and to turn it to their advantage. G. Edward Griffin, The Creature from Jekyll Island, page 374. 
The Rothschilds and the Jesuits used the Civil War to divide the United States into contending countries. This would make America weak and much easier to control. It would facilitate America becoming enslaved to the Jesuits of Rome. In spite of the fact that the Civil War failed to accomplish the destruction of the United States, the Jesuits achieved much of their goal anyway, as conditions in the United States plainly show today. President Lincoln understood the insidious hand of the Rothschild and Jesuit schemers in the Civil War. He understood the massive destructive power of these people. He knew that they were relentless in their pursuit of the destruction of the United States. Lincoln greatly feared for the survival of America and did everything he could to defeat their purposes. He said, in a quote, The money power, the Rothschilds and the Jesuits, preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned, an era of corruption will follow, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the, and the republic is destroyed. It's a quote from Archer Shaw in the Lincoln Encyclopedia, the spoken and written words of Abraham Lincoln, page 40. How prophetic that is exactly what has happened. Abraham Lincoln saw that the Rothschild Jesuit scheme was compromising the leaders of America. By utilizing their endless supplies of money, these evil men controlled many political leaders at the highest levels of the American government, and that was in the mid-1800s. Today, the situation is much worse. American politicians, members of Congress, and government officials are selling their country to the Jesuits for the chance to be wealthy and influential. We saw that even the great Daniel Webster was a pawn in their hands. In a speech in 1937, Abraham Lincoln declared, quote, No foreign power or combination of foreign powers could by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge. At what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? If it ever reaches us, it must spring from among us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of freedom, we must live through all time or die of suicide. That is a uh, plug from the book The United Nations Global Straitjacket by Joan Vion, page 64. Back to the book. Greed, selfishness, and financial gain are used, to are used to compromise politicians to pass laws defeating the purpose of the Constitution and to take America down a path never intended by our founding fathers. These politicians adopt govern governing principles like those of communism and the French Revolution. Following the awful bloodbath called the Civil War, the nation was bleeding and things were in disarray. The country was quite vulnerable to more Jesuit mischief, and they took good advantage of it. <laughs>